Hello, everyone. Welcome to our tech talk on unidirectional data flows. My name is Donald, and I'm really excited to share some of the lessons that the Lyft Android team has learned while building dynamic user interfaces for both our passengers and our drivers. Let me start by introducing myself. I'm currently an Android engineer on Lyft's payments team, and I've been at Lyft for two years. On the payments team, we build infrastructure and features to support drivers cashing out their earnings and also passengers paying for their rides. I was previously a student at UC Berkeley, and in my free time, I like to perform music. Here's a photo of me performing on this stage 10 months ago for Lyft's Asian Pacific American Heritage Month celebration. During today's talk, we're going to talk about what it takes to build a reliable and testable, testable user interface for our users. We're, we're going to start with cascading UI updates, which is the context for why we need some kind of data flow system in our application. And then we'll talk about two different ways of managing the data flow, bidirectional data flows and unidirectional data flows. Cascading UI updates happen when a user input event triggers multiple updates to different parts of the view on the same screen. Let's consider Lyft's rate and pay feature. On this screen, we have the tip selector, which allows passengers to tip their drivers. On the right side here, we have the selected payment method, which can either be a credit card or Lyft credits. At the bottom, we have the total amount charged to the card. And then on the left side there, we have a payment profile. One example of a payment profile is a business profile, where the passenger's ride is reported to the organization, and the organization may even cover the expense of this ride. Now let's look into an example of a cascading UI update. When the passenger selects the tip, the view updates the selected tip to $1. We also update the selected payment method to the credit card because credits cannot be used to pay for tips. And then we update the total amount charged to the card at the bottom. And here's another example of a cascading UI update. The passenger selects the payment profile. The view updates the selected payment profile to a business profile. The selected payment method is updated to the default business payment method. And because credits cannot be used for business rides, we also update the total amount charged to the full price of the ride. Now, let's think about what it would look like to manage the data flow in this feature with a bidirectional data flow. In a bidirectional data flow, the application maintains state in two different layers, both in the view and in the model. Our application might achieve this through a framework like data binding or some kind of custom solution. But the common principle is that state is passed between the two layers. The model might be changed by a polling network request or a system event. And when it changes, it'll tell the view to change as well. And the view might change in direct, change in direct response to a user input event. And when the view changes, it tells the model to change. Now, this architecture by itself seems a little naive. It seems like it's hard to test because the view deals with Android widgets, which are hard to test with unit tests. So what happens if we add a third layer, which is the presenter? The presenter does help a little bit because it allows us to take some of the business logic in the view and move it into Java-only files that can be unit tested. However, it's actually not going to prevent us from running into the problems that we'll get from maintaining application state in two different layers. Now let's apply our bidirectional data flow to our rate and pay feature. In the view, we have the payment profile. And on the right side of the screen here, we have the state of both the view. They start out in sync, and they both say that the payment profile is personal and the price is $7. So we begin with the passenger tapping on the payment profile button. And next, the view state updates from a personal profile to business. And now we have to begin syncing the two states. We now pass the payment profile through the presenter and to the model. When the model receives this new payment profile, it also updates from personal to business. So far, everything is good. The two states are in sync. We don't have any bugs. And the user experience is smooth. But what happens when we get a new product requirement? Suppose that now, when the passenger selects the payment profile, our application has to send a network request to refetch the price of the ride. Suppose that Lyft has written an enterprise contract with an organization so that all of the business rides for this organization are discounted by a dollar. 
Now when the passenger selects the payment profile, the price also changes from $7 to $6. Now let's revisit this step where we've already updated the view state to business and we're in the process of updating the model state. At this point, our application makes a network request to update the payment profile and it also attempts to refetch the price. But what happens if our network request fails? At this point, we have two problems. Our model and our view are out of sync. Our view is showing the user that this is a business ride, but our model thinks that it's a personal ride. The other issue is that we're now showing an incorrect price to the passenger. The passenger thinks that this is a business ride that costs $7 when it actually should cost $6. And we've run into this bug because we've applied a partially successful update to the view. Our application has optimistically updated one part of the view without a guarantee that it can successfully update the rest of the view. And this bug leads us to a few lessons. One is that the view should not update itself in direct response to a user input event. Instead, it should do some kind of action to update the model as the single source of truth. And when the single source of truth changes, the view should update in response. And also we learned from this product requirement that we need some kind of architecture that is flexible enough for us to add an asynchronous operation in response to any user input event. Like Ryan said, we shouldn't have to re-architect our entire feature when product requirements change. We should use an architecture that is flexible. And these lessons lead us to a new way of managing our data flow, which is unidirectional data flows. Now to learn more about unidirectional data flows, let's first look to the world of web development for inspiration. Web developers actually built frameworks to enforce unidirectional data flows many years ago with React and Redux. React is a framework that allows developers to declaratively program their user interfaces, and Redux is a web development framework that manages the application state. Web developers actually solve this problem earlier than mobile developers have because historically, web applications have run on larger screens that are on desktop machines, and larger screens means we can have more view components and more opportunities for cascading UI updates. At a high level, this is what a React and Redux architecture looks like. React takes care of just the view rendering, and then Redux handles the actions, reducer, and model. Now let's go through the data flow of this application. We start with a user input event in the view, and the user input event is mapped to an action. The action can decide whether the application triggers a network request or whether it directly updates the local state. Once that operation succeeds, it returns with an action payload, such as the success response of the network request. We then pass that payload to the reducer, which then decides how to apply that change to the current state. It then outputs a new state to set on the model, and the view is subscribed to the model, so whenever our single source of truth, the model changes, the view changes as well. If we group the action and the reducer together, we can call that an intent. And when I say intent, I don't mean the Android intent class. Rather, it's an abstraction that represents a desired business logic operation that happens in response to either a user input event or a system event. Now let's think about what our rate and pay feature would look like if we were to architect it with React. In React, we have both child view components and parent view components. Our payment profile selector is an example of a child view component, and it's allowed to update its own state. In this case, our screen for the rate and pay feature is our parent view, and it is also allowed to update a child view state. However, if we want to update a sibling view, like the total amount charged to the card, in response to a change to the payment profile, we are not allowed to go up from the child to the parent and then back down to the other child. This actually breaks the rules of a unidirectional data flow, and this is also the source of the bug that we saw in the bidirectional data flow example earlier. Instead, when the user taps on the payment profile, the view can dispatch an action, which then goes through the reducer to update the single source of truth, which is the model. Then when the model changes, the view is subscribed to that change, and we apply the change from the top down, from the parent down to the children. Many Android applications today are architected in some variant of a model view presenter architecture. So we're going to talk about 
what it looks like to enforce a unidirectional data flow in the context of MVP. The first step toward enforcing a unidirectional data flow here is to enforce a single exit point and a single entry point to the view. The key difference between this and a bidirectional data flow is that the exit point of the view is not state. The exit point of the view is an action that the presenter listens to and uses to update the model. On the entry point of the view, the view is listening to state changes from the model through the presenter. In our model layer, we might have a service abstraction that can talk to both the network and the local state. Now let's look into the details of this data flow. Once again, we start in the upper left with the user input. The user input is mapped to a Redux-like action. The action specifies some kind of business logic, like whether we should talk to the network first. And eventually, it updates this cache here, which is the single source of truth in this application. Then the view is subscribed to this change, and the view updates whenever the model updates. Optionally, if our view state is in a different format from our model state, we can transform our model into a view model in the, pre in the presenter layer. And view model actually has different definitions, so I'm going to define it in the context of this slide. In this slide, a view model is a single object that contains all of the data that is necessary to represent the state for the view component. And the view model can even include transient state, like whether the screen is currently loading or not. Now, if we separate the output of the view from the input of the view, we can see how a model view intent works on top of MVP. The intent represents the action and the desired business logic in response to an event, whether it's a user input event or a system event. And the model represents the single source of truth that the view is subscribed to. So some of the principles that we've learned from this unidirectional data flow is that there are benefits when we do not store application state in the view. Instead, we should use the model as the single source of truth. Also, in our React example, we saw that instead of going up through the parent to update a sibling view, a child view should instead dispatch an action to once again update the single source of truth. And finally, when we transform state, state can be transformed from model state to view state, but not the other way around. Now that we have a single entry point to the view, it becomes a lot easier to test the state of our view, because we can declaratively program the state and tell the state to render different parts of it. Here's an example unit test where we begin with setting up our mocks. In this example, let's pretend that we're mocking out our network requests. Then in the middle here, we get an observable stream of view state. And in our final block, we first create a view model or object that represents the expected state of the view. And this view model includes the selected tip and the selected payment method. Then we can assert the different states that the view goes through, including the loading state, and then finally a success state when the network request completes. On the other hand, we can also test the output of the view by testing that specific user input events are mapped to the correct actions to update the model. Learning how to use a unidirectional data flow it does take a little bit more time at first than learning two-way data binding, but I believe that the long-term benefits of unidirectional data flows makes that time worth it. For one, we now have a more predictable application state in a unidirectional data flow. Every change to the application state has to go through the same loop. Now when we're debugging the application, if we're, tr if we're wondering why did the view change in this way, as developers, it becomes very easy to tell whether this change was triggered by a user input event or if it was changed by a system event, because everything is along the same loop. Also, as we saw in our previous example with our unit test, now that we have a single entry point to our view, it becomes very easy to assert the entire state of the view. The improved debugability and testability combined improve developer productivity. Now, instead of wasting time following mindless method calls and control flows, everything is on this conventional loop, and we can tell where the data comes from. And finally, we now have an architecture that is flexible enough for us to add an asynchronous, asynchronous operation in response to any user input event. And this is really helpful when our product requirements change. Now that we've looked at some of the benefits of a unidirectional data flow, how can we apply this at the framework level on Android? Well. We need some kind of Redux-like framework for Android for 
application state management. And we need something similar to React on Android so that we can declaratively program our UIs. So far, Lyft has taken a small step toward enabling declarative UIs with our result object. Our result can contain some content, such as the su success of a network request, but it also holds the state of whether the screen is loading or whether the screen is in, is in an error state or not. Here's an example of how we're currently using Lyft's result object in our rate and pay feature. So in the view, the view observe, observes a stream of state that it gets from the presenter, and every time it receives a new state, it refreshes the entire view. The view also has this binder object, which is responsible for subscribing and unsubscribing from the observable stream of view state. In our presenter layer, we, we begin by composing data from different locations. This observe valid payment details method is composing data from both the network and also the local cache. And then whenever we get new data, we wrap it in either a success, loading, or error result. We want to generalize this solution by cr maybe creating a single observe view state on our, on our presenter. If we, if we create this generic observe view state on every presenter, then we can make this the single entry point to every single view. Then the only way any view can change is through this observable stream of state. Now you might be wondering, if we refresh or redraw the entire screen on every model change, isn't that going to negatively impact performance? Well, one of the ways that we can maintain declarative UI programming while also maintaining high performance is through one of the lessons that we've learned from the React framework. And React's innovation is called the virtual DOM. It, the virtual DOM, once again, allows the, the developer to adopt a mental model of refreshing the entire screen when behind the scenes it makes sure it's performant by redrawing only the changed part of the view. The equivalent of the DOM on Android is the Android layout system, including linear layouts, edit texts, and buttons. And then our virtual DOM mirrors the real DOM. The virtual DOM is an in-memory Java abstraction on top of every Android widget. Now when our model changes, we create a new Java view tree in memory. Then the virtual DOM does a diff of the new state compared to the old view tree, and then it intelligently decides which part of the real DOM to redraw. Now that's the, the input of the view. Let's look at what we're doing for the output of the view in our rate and pay feature. Currently, our feature in our view is deferring to the presenter to do the business logic operation, but we want to once again make our solution for the output of the view generic. One of the ideas we're considering is beginning with Rx bindings, Rx bindings allows us to create observable streams of user input events. Then we can map the user input events to Redux-like actions. And here, the action is an object that contains an action ID, such as tip selection, and also an action payload with information related to that action, such as the amount of the tip selected. Lyft is still in the process of evaluating existing Redux and virtual DOM frameworks on Android. But we're also in the process of deciding whether we should build our own frameworks to support unidirectional data flows. So if you are interested in unidirectional data flows, please chat with us during Q&A. And thank you for listening. <laughs>